Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 145 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest will be Randy McAwee, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we do, let's start with our quote. And that is, when I see you grapple, I am not impressed if you win or lose. What I want to see is your use of the fundamentals of jiu-jitsu. It does not matter how it ends. I do not care if you tap five times as long as you try to use technique. And that is from the legendary Salo Hibero. All right, Randy McAwee is the owner and director of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Athens, Team Pedro Sauer at American Black Belt Academy. He's a retired master sergeant and decorated Special Forces combat veteran in the U.S. Army. His military experience includes service with the 3rd Ranger Battalion and with the 5th Special Forces Group during the unit's participation in the Persian Gulf War, Somalia, and Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom, as well as serving on top-secret classified special category missions, combat experience, and service in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Central America, Kenya, and Panama. He was awarded the Legion of Merit for service that included action during Operation Enduring Freedom as the senior NCO responsible for the planning, direction, and execution of a Joint Chief of Staff directed special category classified project. During his time in Special Forces, he was responsible for bringing the Gracies in to teach techniques and develop the unarmed and Knife Combatives Program for the Special Forces. He's the director of the Special Operations Combative Arts Association and has been training and teaching martial arts for over 30 years. And just some of the things that Randy has accomplished so far include a six-degree black belt in Okawate Bujutsu Kai, third-degree black belt in Mieda Kozen Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu First Degree Black Belt under Professor Pedro Sauer, certified as a Pedro Sauer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Association Level 2 Instructor, certified as a KC Self-Defense Instructor, First Degree Black Belt in Shotokan Karate, certified Goshenru Jiu-Jitsu Instructor, Okabate Bujutsu Kai Karate Instructor, certified American Council on Martial Arts Instructor, Gracie Resisting Attack Procedures for Law Enforcement, or Grapple, Instructor. Georgia Peace Officers Training Council Defensive Tactics Guest Instructor. Certified as Armed Forces Combatives Instructor and Modern Army Combatives Trainer. Certified Special Operations Tactical Combatives Instructor. Director and Founder of the Special Operations Combative Arts Association. Founder of the Reality Urban Combatives Program. Founder of the SAFE, or Sexual Assault Fundamental Escapes, Women's Self-Defense Program. He's a current member of the Pedro Sauer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Association Board of Directors. He was recognized as Educational Funding Company's Outstanding Program Director and Educational Funding Company's Most Inspiring Instructor. He was also the founder of the KICK, 
Karate Inspiring Confidence in Kids Children Martial Arts Program. So Randy has done an amazing amount of things. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview and the chance to get to know him better. So without further ado, let's talk to Randy. All right, I am speaking with Randy McAwee, Pedro Sauer, first degree Pedro Sauer black belt and owner and director of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Athens, Team Pedro Sauer at American Black Belt Academy, which is in Athens, Georgia. And Randy also serves on the board of directors of the Pedro Sauer Association. So welcome to the show, Randy. Thanks, Marty. Uh, appreciate you having me. You and I have had some great conversations, so uh, I'm looking forward to having one uh, that's recorded. Yeah, and for those listening, I've had a chance to uh, get to know Randy uh, a lot more recently and just had some really great, great conversations, a really interesting guy. So I'm excited today, Randy, to be able to to talk to you and, and actually get one recorded so everyone can kind of benefit from our awesome conversations. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah, it's my pleasure. You've done a little bit of everything, it looks like. I mean, man, you've got quite an interesting uh, an exciting background. I know you were, have a long and highly decorated career in the Army Special Forces. You were director of Special Operations, Combative Arts Association, and you're a featured author in Black Belt Magazine, among many other things. But uh, we're going to talk to as many of these as we can. But let's just start by uh, hearing about your journey. How did it get started? How did the, how did you get started in the martial arts, and how did that ultimately lead you to jujitsu, Randy? I started quite a long time ago. Um, I had a class when I was a, a, a teenager in high school in um, Japanese karate. But at the time, it was pretty hard to to get to. There wasn't a lot of it in, in my area. I grew up in a really small town in West Virginia. And uh, to be honest, at the time, we just couldn't afford it. And so I had to put it on the back burner. And then once I got into the military and got a little bit stabilized in, in my stationing, I picked up a course and went and did a Shotokan-based system and uh, kind of saw it all the way through to get my, my first black belt in Shotokan karate. And then once I was there, uh, the, the gentleman that I, I came to study primarily under was a big advocate of the integration of different systems. He was big on the whole idea of you know mixed martial arts for reality, self-defense, and he you know frequently pushed us to have different specialties in different areas. You know, Shotokan was the base to develop good foundational skills, timing, power, you know, uh, distance. But in there, there was also an introduction to boxing and judo. And uh, at the time, uh, Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, which was, you know, the forerunner for me to Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And then uh, along the way in that journey, when the UFC came out, I had a good friend that I trained with that was another Special Forces soldier and uh, was actually a little bit ahead of me in um, in the, the system we were studying. And he invited me over to watch the first UFC. He had a heavy background in judo and already had a judo black belt and was big on the idea of jujitsu and introduced me to it. And like everybody else in the world at that time, I saw, you know, just how amazing it was and had some ideas of mine shattered, uh, you know, from the striking world about what could happen when somebody was capable of closing distance, getting you in the clinch, and then getting you on the ground with some very superior skill that nobody had really seen before. Yes, you you had the same experience I did and, and thousands, if not millions of others, right? I mean, what an eye-opening event and experience, those early UFCs and it's like, you know, like you said, it shattered uh, all these preconceived notions and, and what we all believed in a lot of ways. So it sounds like it had a big impact on you and, and your direction. Definitely. And at the time, we were looking at uh, training for our teams in the Special Forces at Fifth Special Forces Group. And so when we saw this, you know, it automatically opened our eyes to a piece that we needed to explore further and try to bring to uh, the unit for our guys to use. And so as soon as that happened, we started searching for jujitsu. And at the time, uh, you really couldn't find Gracie jujitsu, especially we were stationed, you know, at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. 
and there just wasn't anything Gracie Jiu Jitsu around that we knew about. And so we started off with, with some Japanese Jiu Jitsu and started trying to develop skills from there until we were able to actually make contact and start training with the Gracies. Right on. Fort Campbell, uh, home of the Screaming Eagles, right? They like to claim it, but, you know, the <laughs> Special Forces Group, we say that, you know, we've secretly taken it over. <laughs> gotcha. I'm sure there's no rivalries there back then, huh? <laughs> All in good fun. So back up for a moment. Tell us about your decision, what led you going into the Army, and did you go to the Army and then Special Forces, or did you know right away that you were going to go Special Forces? I had a unique opportunity, and, and really what happened was when I first graduated high school, um, I really thought that I, you know, nobody in my family had been to college, so I really didn't think I was smart enough or had what it took to go to college. I had no idea. Nobody had done it. So the first thing I did was go to work, doing construction work, and it didn't take long uh, you know, those early mornings, long days and serious hard work to decide that that really wasn't for me. And so at the time, I knew the local Army recruiter and actually he had discouraged me from joining the military. But we'd gotten to know each other because he was interested in finding some good deer hunting locations. I helped him out with that. And then uh, he kept kind of turning me down to go into the, the military initially. And finally, I said, hey, I'm, I'm really serious about this. I want to go in. What do you have? And then we looked at some of the, the key things that interest me, and a lot of it was that direction of special forces. At the time, they had a unique opportunity that opened up that allowed uh, individuals to go uh, from right off the street into special forces, if you could make it. The key thing there is uh, it, it was probably a little bit of a mistake to try that. I didn't know any better because I was so young had no idea what it took to, to get in there with that kind of experience. And luckily, because I didn't know that I shouldn't be there, I made it. You know, out of three, there were about uh, 32 of us out of 150 guys that were in on that program that made it all the way to Special Forces. And they say about three out of 100 make it. So those, those numbers kind of filter out about right, oh. especially for that. That's amazing. I have a lot of respect for any any, any military, but uh, especially the elite forces. And I think it takes a special a special person to commit to that and and to uh, get through the training. Whether you're talking about you know seals, rangers, but the the special forces, the Green Berets, have always been a group that I just highly look up to because they're so specialized. You know, they're not just a, a weapons you know experts and, and that kind of thing. And, and but they really can do so many different things, and they're highly cross-trained and, and just specialists of what they do. I, I can imagine going in from the street and then going into something that specialized and that grueling and, and making it through. So uh, total respect for you for doing that, man. Well, you know, th they always say better lucky than good any day. And the one key thing I learned in that process is you really never uh, have any level of success by yourself. I got in there and, and because I was young and at the time I had no idea what I was getting myself into or how difficult it would be, I made quite an impression on some of the senior guys there and I was lucky enough that they took a liking to me as kind of their little mascot and in that process they helped me get through it. I didn't do it by myself, it, it was pure luck and those guys really saw to it that they allowed me to, to go forward and help me get there. So that was really the key for me. That's awesome. Uh, and, and I believe you were your first uh, specialty within the SF was a uh, medic. Yeah, I started out as a special forces medic. Uh, my logic when I first elected that was I knew that uh, there were so many specialties. You know, the, the special forces has some key specialties of weapons, demolitions, uh, communications, medical and then uh, operations and intelligence. My reasoning initially was I, I had known a guy that had left uh, my hometown for the military. He became a radio operator. When he left, he was a real small kid. When he came back, he was huge, right? Buffed, really ripped. And so we talked to him and asked him, hey, you know, how'd you get so big? We, you know, you really have changed. And he, he told us, well, radios are very heavy. <laughs> well, one key concept that, that I thought was band-aids were light. So I thought I'd be a medic. <laughs> now, the, the key thing I was missing because I was so young and naive is that 120 pounds of anything is 120 yeah, pounds. that's for sure. So, <laughs> so I just 
you know, eventually figured out that I would be carrying a lot more Band-Aids and medical equipment. Well, I have a special respect for medics because I was a medic in the Army as well. Uh, first, I was in communications and then went through medic school. And and, and when we talked before about that, you know, at Fort right. Sam. So I got, you know, I got some medical training and later on went uh, and got my nursing degree. But got medical training and, uh, you know, a little taste of doing it out in the in the wild, in the wilderness. And so to see special forces medics, they're on a whole nother level. And that's why many people in the field, you know, refer to them as doc or something like that, because uh, you're out there, you're everything. Whenever, uh, when you're out there, you're what they have, right? Absolutely. We were really blessed because we get a lot of training in a lot of diverse areas because the special forces teams are designed to function uh, on missions for a long duration, deep behind enemy lines. So you don't have access a lot of times to medical evacuation, to a physician, to anybody at a higher level. So a lot of things fall directly on you as the medic on the ground to be able to do these things. So you get training in everything from, uh, you know, surgical techniques. Um, emergency medicine is definitely one of the specialties. Uh, dealing with, you know, long-term disease processes. And then you also branch out into uh, doing dental procedures, doing veterinary procedures. You, you name it, if it comes under the you know, title of medic, it is, you know, dropped down to the special forces medic and you get a chance to really get a lot of training on it. That's when I figured out that maybe if I had decided to go to college from the beginning, I might've been okay. Cause I was taking these college level courses that are normally, uh, you know, for doctors and they were very condensed, very compressed. And the timeline for learning the material and testing through it was very high pressure. Yeah, if you could handle that, you certainly could have handled college because the rigors and the the information is at the uh, as high, if not higher level, and then condensed time frame, and then under stressful conditions many times, I'm sure, stress more stressful than if you're sitting in a college classroom. The key to a lot of the training, especially with the special forces, is taking very basic tasks and then putting them into scenario-based training to help you deal with them under a high adrenaline dump so that You've got this process committed to memory under extreme stress. It works very well. Well, you just described great martial arts. <laughs> because Absolutely. <laughs> keeping it basic and simple, and then when it's that reptilian brain kicks in, you got to be able to function and do it on autopilot, right? Absolutely. You know, a lot of people uh, think that being in special forces or in special operations as a soldier means knowing a lot more. It, it does mean knowing a little more, but it means being a lot better. And what we say is brilliant at the basics, really having the basics down to where they're instinctual. And that's kind of the thing that really attracted me to jujitsu is because it is a condensed individual version of that same kind of training and concept of mission focus for combat. Yes. Well, I mentioned the amount of respect I have for the special forces, but I, I also don't, I try not to idolize any persons or, or groups of people, you know, too high. And uh, I know yeah, some people. always get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if you live long enough, you kind of learn that. Uh, have respect for someone, but don't idolize them too much. And, and you know, a lot of people, their only real uh, notion, if you will, of, of what a Green Beret is, was is like Rambo. Or if you're old enough to, to remember if you're old enough like me to remember right, John, John Wayne, Wayne. yeah, <laughs> and the uh, and Cream Berets. But, you know, not everybody's a Rambo, I'm sure. And not everybody is the, the same high-quality person. And I'm not, I'm not asking you to, you know, do, do dirt on, on Special Forces, but just speak to the kind of human element. And, and was there anything surprising to you when you got into it? Well, you know, it's like anything else, just like jujitsu itself. It's full of great people. It's full of amazing people, and it's full of guys that you wonder, how in the world did you get here? <laughs> uh, you know, everybody has the, those individuals that you look around, they've passed every, you know, obstacle that has been presented to them, the, the selection process, the training process, even some of the highest level training programs within, uh, you know, our organization that people go to and, and are weeded out with, there are guys that that pass those and and for the life of many of us you can't figure out why or how uh, but they still exist the the best part about it is it's a it's a numbers game there are more amazing people there than there are of the other type and the key is if you can put yourself in the right circle and stay there long enough 
the good will rub off on you. It's, it's one of the reasons that I'm pretty excited about being part of the Pedro Sauer Association. We have so many great people, so many nice people, so many talented individuals, especially with respect to jujitsu, but, but also in many other areas that to be in that circle just kind of helps, you know, make me a better person in whichever area I'm trying to focus on. And that's really what I was lucky enough to experience in special forces. One of the key things there is, uh, you know, the motto is the quiet professional. So you get to be around a ton of guys in an organization where um, almost nothing is ever said about what they've done or accomplished. And the only way you find out is every now and then you'll run into somebody else who was there and says, hey, do you know the story behind this guy? And they'll tell you something really amazing about the kind of individual that you've been working with every day and had no idea about. So that's kind of the, the key is that, um, you know, just like every other aspect of the world, there's bad people and, and guys that you really, you know, would rather not be there, but the percentages of quality people are much higher. Well, that's all you can ask for, right? Because like you said, there's, there's no perfect group of people or a great, uh, perfect profession that doesn't have all kinds of people. So if you get if you land somewhere that has a lot more of the, the good ones, and that's the place to be for sure. Right. So, and when you're surrounded by them, the, the pressure to be better is always there and you feel it and, and then you try to live up to it. Absolutely. So you're in the Special Forces. You got interested in jujitsu through UFC. Tell us more about that. I know you ended up bringing Orion in. So tell us about that whole process. Well, when we first started, like I said, there, there was no Gracie jujitsu anywhere to be found. So we started tracking it down. We found out that the only way that we could get it was to start to travel to regional seminars that were being conducted by Hoist and Horian in order to help develop and spread jujitsu throughout the United States and through different schools that were starting to crop up at the time. So we developed a program and convinced our chain of command to allow a few of us, and I was the primary one because I was the one making the stink to go and, and you know, writing the concepts and, and putting forward the idea that we would bring this training back to the special forces using this technique. So we were centrally located between um, Memphis, Tennessee and Lexington, Kentucky. They were both uh, about three hours away and we determined that every six months in one of those locations, there was a long weekend seminar, three day uh, seminar conducted by either Hoist or Horian or, or some combination that produced training for schools in that area. So the first time I got to go, I went to a, a, a seminar sponsored and put on by Chad Chilcutt in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, excellent guy, got us in there. We went, Hoist was there, got to start training. And then that started our process. So we would learn what we could. We would go back and in the interim, we discovered the, the VHS videotape series that Horian had put together and was selling. Oh, yeah. So we got us a copy of that. We went to the seminars to get things refined in between. We would do the techniques from the videos. And then uh, from there, we would supplement by videotaping the training that we were doing. So I, one of the things I would do is we had training for our teams, I did, on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. I would videotape the lesson that I taught to them. Then I would go home, watch it. And then, you know, kind of tweak it a little bit and then come back on Thursday, do the same thing. And then on Fridays, we would, you know, after our fitness training, we would sit down and watch the videos from from uh, during our breakfast from the training that week. And then we would revise it. And we just kind of built our own training program that way. It was very rough. Uh, whenever we got to see, uh, you know, Horian or Hoyce, especially Horian, he would, you know, he was just astonished and maybe even horrified at what we were doing with his jujitsu. <laughs> And then he just tried to bracket us into where we became more smooth, you know, more detailed. And, and in the beginning, that was our biggest challenge. Same thing I see today with guys that come in that are brand new to jujitsu. They, they think it is an art of cardio and strength when it's exactly opposite. And that's what we did, as, especially as Special Forces soldiers. Our idea and answer to everything was more speed, more surprise, more violence of action. And that's what we brought to the jujitsu training. And they had to kind of refine us and get us to start to embrace the idea of learning technique. Mm. That sounds like an interesting process because you guys were like, gung-ho, let's go. Let's push <laughs> full steam ahead, right? 
Right. More and, is and better. We were playing with it in between the seminars, and eventually we convinced the command to bring Horian out for a full week of training to train us and create uh, a, a larger instructor training program so that we would have more knowledge in Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And when we did that, I was lucky enough to be his sponsor during that week while he was there with us. So I got to spend a lot of off time with him. And really that was kind of incredible and life changing for me, especially when it comes to jujitsu, because I got to see the philosophy behind the training that he was you know, teaching us. And I got to understand a lot more about the process. And so that really you know, changed my perception of how I approached and dealt with putting together training for jujitsu. That's great. You know, it says it speaks a lot to you and, and that group to want it so much that you're willing to kind of go anywhere or do anywhere to get it and, and piece it together on your own in between training sessions. And, and then when you do get around someone in person that, uh, you know, you highly respect in the jiu-jitsu world, uh, it kind of brings it all home to like, man, I'm, I get to see it kind of in, in living action now. And I'm sure that's, like you said, that uh, impacted your life on a, on a huge level. Absolutely, because as, as soon as I got a real taste of it, I I became hugely addicted, like a lot of people do, and I chased it like a rabid dog. <laughs> and, you know, so I was looking for more and more training. And one of the things that I got from my time in Special Forces is the level of professionalism there, it really is revealed when it comes to your off time and your hobbies. Guys there don't really have many hobbies that aren't related to the job in some way. You know, what they do in their off time is they'll go do parachute training. They'll go, you know, go scuba diving. That was one of my big loves until I found Gracie Jiu-Jitsu as I was diving a lot. Other guys, you know, they spend their extra time shooting firearms, getting better in those areas. And guys are almost always doing something connected to that job and the mission. They, they don't really have any true hobbies. They just have extensions of their career. Interesting. Interesting. So where did it go from there? What was your next phase of, of jiu-jitsu? Well, from there, we, you know, we, we brought Horian in. We developed the training program. Uh, we had put together a, a curriculum. It was very refined. I, I was lucky enough to do that. It's one of the specialties that I had while I was in Special Forces, and I've kind of you know, continued to develop that. It's one of the things that, that I do uh, probably more than anybody else. Within the special, you know, special forces, guys tend to, you know, have a little niche. Well, that became one of my niches, along with the jujitsu, is putting things into these detailed training programs. And I've been blessed enough to continue to do it. And one of the big differences, you know, being in the Pedro Sauer Association and the reason that I was lucky enough to, to be invited onto the board is because of my background and knowledge in putting these programs together. There, there's an immense amount of jujitsu knowledge. Uh, that I can't begin to reach within the association, guys that are just amazing at jujitsu. But the one thing that I have that's a talent is I can put it into a program that can put it out to people who have never seen it before and bring them to an efficiency level very smoothly, very quickly, and in a very structured manner. So, you know, that was kind of what cinched it for me. From there, uh, originally, there were a lot of things that were kind of planned out at the time. I was about to complete most of my operational time in special forces and then i was you know working towards moving out we'd already discussed me taking a position that runs the what we call our isolation facility where all the training is done you know preparing for specific missions and where teams are put into you know isolation out of contact with everybody else when they prepare to launch out on these critical missions that are dictated you know by the command uh so i was going to be running that and and Doing that, I was going to be the main instructor for the combatives program for special forces. It was kind of mapped out. And there was even discussion that afterwards they might create a civilian position, and that would be my career path moving forward. I was very excited about it. And then uh, one morning while we were doing jujitsu, September 11th, uh, everybody knows what happened that day. The terrorists hit the towers, you know, uh, crashed the planes into the Pentagon. All these other things took place at once, and in the blink of an eye, everything changed. Uh, you know, we isolated right away. That first day, we, we went into lockdown, started packing equipment, began to get ready for dealing with that. And then all those plans for jujitsu were, were put on hold for about the next year and a half while things were, you know, dealt with in regard to that terrorist situation. 
Mm. Yes, what an what an incredible day. I'm sure everybody listening can remember exactly where they were, you know, when that happened. You know, and it kind of kills me that it's been over 20 years and and it seems like a lot of the country's lost a lot of that uh, initial let's 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 you know, let's rally as a country and uh be proud of of who we are and uh, that we're Americans and it seems like lately that just uh hasn't been the case for a lot of a lot of Americans. Well, luckily, because guys have been pretty dedicated to dealing with that cause as an away game for the last 20 years and meeting it over there, it hasn't come back to America, especially on that level. And, you know, whenever you have a chance to get away from that kind of very serious event and it never impacts you directly, you get the the benefit and, you know, also the curse of not having to deal with it. Mm. So you you become uh you know just naive to the fact of what what that devastation brings to people and how it can impact the world That's, uh luckily we haven't had to deal with it absolutely luckily we haven't and and uh props to the great american men and women who've been uh preemptively you know and proactively ensuring that that, that hasn't happened so uh how did you get drawn to sp- Pedro Sauer and the Pedro Sauer Association, and because uh, I know that's kind of where you've landed and, and kind of built a home. So, uh, how did that happen, Randy? Well, uh, after after the unit's involvement in uh, Afghanistan in response to the 9/11 attacks, I got my choice of assignment, and um, one of the things I looked at was, you know, where would I go? And so I wound up coming to the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. And while I was here, I, I taught combatives uh, to the to the uh, cadets there. I started a women's self-defense program, and it became kind of the natural process and, and started looking at, well, what would I do next as my next career? I settled on opening a martial arts school, and at the time, I was still primarily a karate guy, even though I was continuing to train jiu-jitsu and start to develop. I'd gotten my blue belt from Hoist Gracie, and... I was looking for more training. I wanted to get more serious about it. So when I retired in 2005, I began to look and search to figure out where I would get this training. You know, how far was it going to have to go? How could I bring it back and really get, you know, realistic and legitimate skill in the art? And I I eventually found a spot in Atlanta and I started driving, uh, you know, once or twice a week two hours one way, and and I would go, I would train for at least three hours. I would usually do a private lesson, uh, stay for a a beginner class, then also for a master cycle class, then roll, and then I would climb into the car, drive back two hours in time to do classes at my academy. And that was usually uh, my Wednesday and or Friday sessions that I did. I did that every week for nine years until I got my brown belt. Uh, At the time when I first started, with, uh, you know, with the training, the school that I was training at was a Pedro Sauer Association. And that's when I first met Professor. That, you know, as an affiliate, he came in to do a seminar. I was lucky enough also during that time to get to train with with Grandmaster Alio and meet him. So that kind of sparked that renewed interest of, of going down that authentic path and really getting it from the source. Then the the school that I was training at eventually became a Gracie uh, Academy affiliate, and that changed the training curriculum a little bit. But at the time, since we were indirectly under Gracie Academy, we maintained a portion of our curriculum that came from the Pedro Sauer Association, and then we integrated the training of Gracie University or Gracie Academy at the time and you know had a curriculum that covered kind of both areas. And so it allowed us to have this unique hybrid of training that fit together very well, and we advanced through that. And then uh, once I got my brown belt, you know, I wanted to have my school directly under Master Pedro Sauer. I, we looked at some other uh, affiliates and academy associations, but the one that was the most welcoming and the best fit for us turned out to be, you know, the the Pedro Sauer Association. And then you know we found our home there, and we've been there ever since, and and really are blessed to be working directly with Professor uh, almost on a daily basis now. Awesome. 
And I know we were talking before and you shared with me one of the, the main motivations you had for starting the academy is to, to really spend time with your son and kind of build that together. So tell us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. The, the key is, as I was winding down in my career in special forces, one of the things that I realized you know, at the time was uh, I, we had waited a long time to have my son. So at the time, he was born in 2000. So as 9-11 rolled around, we were already, you know, looking toward kind of winding down, having more of a family oriented uh, setup. And then when uh, things kicked off after 9-11, that wasn't an option anymore. And I, I had to be away again. And so that was really important to me. You know, I was on my second marriage and my first marriage, I had kids from that marriage. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the chance and it was very difficult to try to build the connection with them. And so I really wanted to ensure that that didn't happen again. And so once I got to the University of Georgia, I started looking at retiring. That was my last assignment as, uh, you know, an instructor in the military science department. I decided that one of the things I wanted to get out of my, you know, next career was the opportunity to be home. And at the time, there were a lot of offers to do the same thing I had been doing uh, prior to coming to the University of Georgia. I had been in charge of our special projects section, which is kind of like our plain coves division. So I had some, you know, extra special skills. I had a top secret clearance. I had a lot of things that offered me the opportunity to keep doing those kind of things in the civilian sector as a contractor. But all of those things, even though they paid very well, they meant time away from my son. And I had already kind of, you know, tried to wind down and, and get to a point to where I was gonna be able to spend time with him. And so as I looked at it, I decided the best opportunity for me to do that would be to change my life around to where I had a job, you know, a, a position that allowed me to have him with me every day. And the, the academy allowed me to do that to where I could pick him up from daycare, uh, you know, bring him to the school. He was there uh, to attend the kids classes. Then, you know, he would go home. I would work. But I got a chance to be with him and be around him every day. And in, in the process, he's grown up through our program, you know, starting out with our classes for Little Dragons at, at age five. He actually started at age four and then moving up through the process all the way now until he actually teaches our kids classes, teaches the majority of our beginner classes and even some of our advanced courses. And we get to work together every day. We actually just had lunch together after a day of uh filming instructional videos today, right before I jumped on the podcast with you. So it, it's really been very rewarding and fulfilling for that to work out. Man, that is, that's great. What, what's his name? His name's Ryan. Ryan, shout out to Ryan. Uh, it's got to be uh, amazing to share that with your son. Um, I had, when I had an academy a while back, uh, years back, my son was still pretty young. And so he was there training and it was only for about three years but during that time I really loved sharing that with him once um once I went got away from the having the academy and about the same time he started discovering football and <laughs> that was all he wanted to talk about and uh, periodically I still bring it up and say hey man let's train a little jiu-jitsu or, or we, you know not, uh, let's at least do some self-defense and he's like rah, rah, rah. but I've, I've, I've almost got him uh, uh, to agree to do a little bit with me but um, I think that's uh, wonderful that you guys share that and you're able to spend that time cultivating not only the relationship but building the academy together I was actually very lucky during that that one week I spent with Horian and I got to talk to him you know outside of the training we were doing I asked him I was like you know you guys in your family start jujitsu uh, you know like about the age most people start walking, how do you begin to get a child to do that and to learn jujitsu? And, you know, he said to me, oh, Randy, it's very easy. And, and he explained to me that one of the things that he did was it was always play. And they've turned that into a great program today yes. with Gracie Games. And, and you know, he kind of clued me into doing some of those things with my son. And the one thing he told me was always make sure that you stop while they want more. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, you know, cause they always say, do it again, do it again. And one of the keys that, that he, you know, imparted to me was, you know, say, no, no, we, we, we can't, we got to stop right now. We'll do some more later. And I use that concept with my son consistently. I used to, you know, uh, bribe him to take his nap when I would pick him up from preschool by mentioning to him that we would, you know, do some training if he took his nap. 
And so it always became that one little thing that I held out in front of him to encourage him, you know, to do other things that we needed him to do, but it was always a reward. And so it worked out really well. And, and I mean, he, he loves it and is obviously addicted to it today. That's wonderful, man. All right. So going back to Professor, Professor Sauer. So you decided to do an academy, but I want to learn more about uh, the academy. But first, what, uh, what's the biggest lesson or impact, uh, lesson you've learned from Professor or impact he's had on you and your journey? Probably the greatest thing I, I learned from him, and, and I got a little spark of it from Horian, is that, you know, if you've ever met Professor and you've ever trained with him, he is the nicest guy on the planet. It is just, you know, it's refreshing for your soul to be around him because mm. he is so genuinely nice. He truly cares about everybody. He really, you know, transmits that whenever he comes in the room about what a genuine caring person he is. And, and one of the things that, that I saw that I wanted was I wanted to be that person. You know, uh, uh, some of my experiences in the military required that, hey, there were times when I had to be very harsh, uh, you know, and so I didn't want to be a mean person. I, I had the experience of meeting, knowing, and dealing with a lot of mean people along the way. And to me, it just didn't seem like a good way to live. So once I connected with Professor, I got that feeling of just how nice he is and how genuine he is with everybody. It was one of those things that I wanted to bring into my life. I knew I could get the jujitsu. I could definitely get that, you know, other places, other ways. And a lot of people now offer jujitsu all over the place. But if you don't impart the, you know, principles and lessons and values that go with jujitsu, all you're doing is teaching violence. And I, you know, I was blessed enough to learn plenty of violence while I was in special forces. So I wanted to add to my character and my personal value instead of just my skill in combat. Wow. That, I mean, you said a lot right there. Refreshing to your soul to, to be around him. That, <laughs> I hope someday someone can say that about, about me. I mean, that's like the ultimate compliment. But you're right. Uh, anybody that's ever met Professor, is, he's so genuine and so nice and such a classy guy, you know, such an example of a, a wonderful human being. You know, you hear a lot of different things in jiu-jitsu, one camp to the other, you know, talking about, about this person or that. But I never once ever heard anybody say a negative thing about Professor Sauer. He's just, I, just a great absolutely. guy, you know. And you know what? It goes the other way. I, I've seen instances where a professor had every right to maybe say something about somebody, and he wouldn't say even the, the slightest unkind word. Uh -huh. And you know what? I, I admire that a lot. I'm aspiring to get there. I'm not there yet. But, you know, it's one of those things that, that every time I get to deal with him, hopefully a little bit of it's rubbing off, and I'm becoming a little bit better of a person because of my interaction with him. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we all need role models like that, for sure. Absolutely. So you started your academy, you're you're building it up. I think you just had uh, like your 17th year anniversary, was it? Yeah, we just had the 17th anniversary of when we signed the lease and started the build out. We're, we're working towards on the 1st of April, and, and I thought it was a very appropriate day, you know, April Fool's, <laughs> for me to open a business of my own, because I wasn't a businessman when I started. Uh, I'm still not. You know, I was a special forces soldier and I needed to approach it that way. When I first started out, I tried to be a businessman. And one of the things I realized was that wasn't my personality. You know, I was a soldier on a mission to run a successful, structured training academy that taught martial arts. And so I had to rethink it that way. And so now whenever I'm coaching people for business or I'm, you know, trying to teach those lessons, one of the things I try to do is make sure that people you know, first understand who they are before they try to be a businessman or something that they're not. And I think that's an important idea whenever you try to have your own business is to make sure it's a reflection of you. Mm. And that's big. That's big because so many people, you know, it's important to find a model, you know, kind of something to, or, or an example to, to model your business and your growth after but too many people too many times people try to take that and just be that same you know same way that cookie cutter almost instead of really and sometimes they lose kind of who they are in the process and and it may or may not work out successfully as far as financially and that kind of thing and students but what you just said i mean if you keep yourself in it and and understand who you are bring that and 
let that guide you. Then you learn the other things along the way, man, you're going to come out a lot better. Right. We use the same approach whenever we teach our students jujitsu. We we first teach them the foundational techniques, the same thing I had to do with business. I had to learn the foundational principles and techniques in order to run the business. But once you get the foundation in place, it's important that you don't try to become a carbon copy of somebody else. You know, everybody's got a different body type. Everybody's got a different personality. And you've got to fit your jujitsu around that. We tell everyone it's like getting a custom suit. Mm. You may take it off the rack and, you know, have certain things that you like about it, but you're going to customize it. You may change the lapel so that you like that style better. You're obviously going to have it taken in so that it fits your body type, but your goal with your jujitsu is to have it completely personalized to you so that it feels right for you. And you can't do that if you simply copy somebody else. Now, you can take elements from different people and you can add certain principles. But if you try to just put on somebody else's jacket, you know, or try to use somebody else's jujitsu, the likelihood of it being a perfect fit for you is much smaller. Yes, totally agree with that. And, and great, great for you to have learn that, you know, early on and not just in your own jujitsu development and how you impart that on others, but as an instructor, the same thing applies. You know, you, you certainly have to learn fundamentals. You have to learn from great teachers and learn those elements. But then if you try to be a carbon copy, you're just going to be a second best version of someone else. But if you really take who you are and your own special sauce, so to speak, and really, you know, take those fundamentals you've learned, but then express them you know, individually through who you are, it's, it's going to be a, a much more impactful. Right. I think it's critical, especially if you're trying to run an academy. I think people can sense when you're not being genuine. So if you're trying to use techniques or business systems that you got from someplace that don't really fit your beliefs and don't fit the culture of your academy, then you're kind of, you know, running into a natural resistance and people sense that whenever they they talk to you or they try to train with you and they, they get a vibration that says something's not consistent here. And it makes them, you know, kind of shy away from, from being one of your students. A lot of times, I think it's important that, you know, no matter what you do, you be genuine, listen to a lot of things. You know, there are a lot of things that, that I still listen to as far as business systems and programs and several of them I listen to and I decide, you know what, that may be very effective for your business or for you as an individual, but it doesn't fit my style, my personality, and the culture of my academy and what I want for my students. So I won't implement it. I won't adopt it. It's just not the right fit. Yes. It's a, it's a bit of the Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do philosophy, right? Absorb what is useful. So uh, Absolutely. Uh, he was a model of, you know, exposing himself to everything he could and then picking what really works for him, for his body top, type and for his philosophy, et cetera. So it sounds like you're uh, in line with that kind of philosophy. Sure. I, I made the mistake when I first opened the school of trying to be everything to everybody. Ooh. And I quickly realized that all I did was, you know, make myself stressed and frustrated. And then I, I didn't deliver the right, you know, thing to the person that came in because I was promising something that maybe I wasn't. And I was I was doing my best to give it to them, but because I was trying to be everything to everybody, it didn't allow me a chance to specialize and refine in one area. So, you know, once we looked at it and, and figured out that, hey, we're a self-defense academy, this is what we focus on. We do it in a different way. We're very basic. Uh, you know, it goes back to being in special forces. For me, every technique I look at and everything we introduce for me, the value is, will it work in a combat situation? And what do I have to ingrain for it to be the instinctive default when that situation arises? We still play with, you know, techniques and sporty stuff and because we want to understand it. More people than ever are learning jujitsu, and some of them are learning in a sport environment. So we've got to be able to deal with that. But at the same time, our core focus and what we do as a default is always going to be self-defense for realistic situations against people that primarily don't know jujitsu and, you know, may attack us out in the world. Yes. And I, I absolutely believe that is the, the, certainly the biggest area. Well, I don't want to say everybody should focus on, but I, I totally agree with that uh, for me as well. So Randy, what in your time of owning the Academy, what's uh, one of, or, or some of the biggest leadership and business lessons that you've learned? Well, well, really, I was lucky enough to be exposed to a lot of things leadership wise while I was in the army and while I was in special forces. And the greatest gift I got from all that is a sense of team. 
a, a lot of folks that, that I know and meet and work with have not had the benefit of understanding and, and realizing to the level that I did what team means. And, and it, it's difficult. If you've never had an experience to where you do work with a team. You know, a lot of times the only way to get that is, is growing up, you get involved in sports and you're a member of a team there. But having come from special forces, it's a completely different concept because their team is all about whether or not you survive. And so that leadership system that I learned because I was lucky enough to, to be in charge of that special project section, to be a team sergeant and run a team even before that while I was in special forces, and to learn from some of the greatest warriors on the planet during my time there as I was coming up through the ranks, I got to, to really see leadership at all levels. You know, I was lucky enough to, to uh, you know, be briefing the Joint Chief of Staff, Colin Powell, and things like that during my career. So I got to see it at all levels, and I really got a lot of opportunity to see great leadership, and then I had a few chances to see some really poor leadership. And it's amazing what small factors come into play and you know, in order to make the difference. So one of the things that I got out of it is how important it is to, to your team. And when I say team, I don't just mean my staff of instructors and, and the folks I'm working with there. I mean my team as far as my students, because I've got to, you know, I got to connect with them and I got to find out, you know, what's going on, what's their goal, what is it they really want to get out of jujitsu. And then I've got to work with them in order to get them there. And, and my biggest responsibility is always to my team at the lowest level, which is my students. And that responsibility, first and foremost for me, is making sure that as I teach them jujitsu, I instill in them the default habits that are going to lead to success if they ever get into a life or death altercation out on the street. And some of those things are very simple, like making sure people always stand up in base each and every time, making sure that when we do train weapons, that the, the folks that are disarming the weapons never hand the weapon back. They always, you know, toss it aside, take control of it themselves or place it in a position to where their attacker can't get to it again. So those kind of simple concepts and, and making sure that the first instinct for them in training is something that is going to, you know, put them in the best possible light. So it becomes reflexive. I love what you're saying about that, the weapons. I mean, I love, you know, a lot of good stuff right there for sure. But that just really stands out is, is those little things regarding uh, a weapon, you know, not putting it back, giving it back to them or putting it in, where they have access to it. Those are uh, seemingly small, but very significant things like you, because how you train is, is how it's going to go down, right? Reflectively, right. you might just do one of those things, not even thinking about it. So that's, and really you know, cool. that, that is absolutely the key and core to that is one of the things I learned during my time in special forces is whatever you do consistently is especially what you'll do when the heat is on and the adrenaline is high, That's right. you will do whatever you've always done. And if it's a, you know, a small thing, and this even happened uh, when when the U.S. invaded Panama, they had soldiers that parachuted into Panama. And, you know, if you know anything about military parachuting, when you first get on the ground, your responsibility is to to get the parachute and bag it up in order to turn it in or in a combat situation to make sure it's not floating around to where if there are aircraft coming in, it could get sucked into the, the rotors of a helicopter or the engine of an aircraft. So you try to stash it away. Well, one of the things that they teach you to do is to stand up and, you know, roll this big parachute around your arms in a figure eight style. So guys were jumping into combat with bullets firing at them. And because that's what they had trained to do, they actually stood up and some of them were shot because of that. Oh, man. And the same thing happens. You can see it in some YouTube videos where you have, you know, trained people, police officers, other individuals that take a weapon from somebody and without thinking they'll hand it back because that's what they have done in training. Wow. And so it's absolutely critical that you make sure you program yourself to where you don't do these things that, you know, are trivial in, in training in the school, but are, you know, perhaps life altering out on the street. So that's one of the things we focus on. And, you know, we, we always have a great debate with uh, folks that are in a, a sport focused program. I love the sport of jujitsu. I love, you know, like I said, I got started on all this because of the UFC and seeing it. And I still love to see that type of, you know, interaction and, and controversy with people for training. It's a great thing. The confusion comes in when people think that training for self-defense isn't different. 
And, and I always inform people that the techniques are very much the same. The only real difference in the techniques may be because of the weight classes, I need to focus a little bit more on the details so that I can make it work against a bigger, stronger opponent because we don't have a weight class out on the street. But the real issue that comes into play is, you know, I, I tell them, what if I took a two before, laid it on the ground and asked you to walk across this 12 foot two before, you know, one foot in front of the other. Do you feel like you could do it? Most people agree. Yeah, I absolutely could. What if I let you practice it a few times, you got the hang of it, and you really understand the mechanics? Now I'm going to take that same two before. We're going to go downtown to a five-story building, and I'm going to put it across between two buildings, and I want you to walk across it. Well, what's changed? The, the mechanics are still the same, correct? Correct. But the risk has gone way up, and you have no idea what will happen. That's the difference in self-defense and the sport aspect. I think there's some great things to be learned from competition and competing. The one thing that, that we see is the one thing you get from going to a competition that, that's hard to replicate anywhere in class is that feeling of not knowing what you're facing. You don't right. know the other person unless you've studied it and you're very heavy in the competition and you know the, the individuals. So you have no idea what you're going to deal with. So that adrenaline yes. surge comes on just like it would for a real confrontation because you have no idea what's going to happen. You might get totally embarrassed. You might get choked out. You know, there those things are very real options, but it, it's also slightly different. So when we train at the academy, we have to ingrain these reflexive concepts. And then we also use certain uh, training opportunities to increase and to interject that adrenaline. We have a program that we do from time to time that we call HEAT, the Highly Effective Accelerated Training Program. And what we do is we do a three-day camp where we focus in on these concepts of introducing adrenaline into the training mm -hmm. so that you, you know, are adrenalized and you see the difference. And, and it's, a, you know, just a little different focus in training. The techniques are, the, are very similar, but because there's no punching in most jujitsu training, you can sometimes neglect that opportunity. And the first yes. thing most people do in an altercation, if they don't know jujitsu, is try to hit you. Absolutely. And if you're not used to doing that, you're, you're, you're like a fish out of water. I, I, uh, I did some training, uh, instructor certification on something called fast fear, adrenal stress training mm -hmm. and, uh, Bill Kip, you might be familiar with that, but yeah, it's, it's from know. way back. And, and, uh, it's an eye opener because you can learn techniques all day, but if you've never adrenalized them and we do seminars for, you know, like soccer moms or anybody else, and you had to keep everything very basic because you, like we mentioned before the reptilian brain uh, you don't want to have over complicated techniques but uh, part of it was what we called wolfing i'm sure you do it in some manner too but right. where you get in yeah. your face and you know <laughs> yell at them and you know just really evoke that uh, fight or flight and and you know you see it in their face you see it in their body like <gasps> oh my god and unless your training involves some of that at least sometimes you're really missing out on the opportunity to, to have it you know have some realism in it on the other hand, and I think I think that's really needed and, and many times uh, missing in some programs. On the other hand, and I know you're a big advocate of this as well, you also, you know, along with your real reality self-defense type uh, focus, you also want to have fun. And I know you've talked a lot about if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong and people aren't <laughs> going to stay. So it's a good balance, Absolutely. right? Right. And one of the big things that I was lucky while I was in the military is I got to do a tour with the Rangers. And as a special forces guy, I went there as a special consultant after the Black Hawk Down incident to uh, help them with some of the, the training priorities, especially on the medical side. And one of the things that, that you know, people would recognize if they ever had the opportunity to be in the military and serve with those two organizations is the Rangers are a much younger group of folks and they're deadly serious everything all the time. You know, they're very tightly wound, very high strung, <laughs> yeah. and they need to be that way in order to accomplish their missions. When you go to the, you know, a special forces group and you hang out with them, you may sometimes wonder, wow, are these guys even involved in the game at all? Because <laughs> part of their, you know, their approach is having a lot of fun, joking a lot and, you know, not necessarily being serious in every moment. But when it comes time to do business, they're very serious and very professional. But people don't always see it that way. One of the reasons people prefer a lot of times to have one over the other is when you're young, you may need that structure. You may need everything kind of you know laid out for you and 
and defined so that you know what you're doing and you feel secure in the process. But as you get a little older, you you don't want to have unnecessary stress. There's just right. no need for it. And especially in a job where stress is kind of what it's all about, you'd like to enjoy your day as much as possible. Well, the same thing's true with jujitsu. Nobody wants to come in and just you know be ground into the mat time and time again. If you can't do it and have fun, and this is really one of the great lessons I learned from Professor is there's no reason not to smile when you're doing jujitsu. It is a lot of fun, even if you're getting tapped. If you if you relax and and think about it, that's fun too because you're learning something. And so we always try to bring that approach to our training. We try to have a really good time when we're doing it, and you know we, we focus on having a fun time to be seriously prepared because that's really the key is we want you to be prepared. But at the same time, if you don't enjoy the environment and the group and, you know, the training itself, you're probably not going to stick with it. And, and we all know how hard it is for people to really hang in there for jujitsu. Anyway, it's not right. necessarily an, an easy endeavor. So true. So true. And you mentioned the smiling. It reminded me of in my, uh, in my program breathing for BJJ. That's one of the little tips uh, right. Put is, man, if you're smiling as you do it, you're more relaxed and you're going to be better, you know, all around um, and a lot less stressed and and, uh, and and be able to breathe better and have more fun. One of the, the reasons we, you know, when we were looking for a combative system originally, we looked at a lot of different programs. We looked at, you know, Krav Maga. We looked at a, a program called SCARS that the Navy had, had used. Yeah. We looked at other programs that were very serious and, you know, very brutal. One of the reasons we chose Gracie Jiu-Jitsu as, as the primary basis for what we were going to do is the attitude we got from Horian was, you know, relax, do the move. It, it was built into everything else we were already doing. The last thing you need is to be extra tense whenever you're in a confrontational situation. You know, whether you, you're working on shooting, whether you're working on parachuting, whether you're working on scuba diving, anything you're doing in those areas being tense really doesn't help That's you right. any. So we like the idea of integrating that into our our hand to hand and unarmed combat systems as well. And and that goes with let's say you take a, a beginner and I'm sure you've heard the the notion of you don't have to fight to learn to fight. So right. taking a beginner <laughs> and they're already overwhelmed, it took everything they could to get in the, the door half the time. And if you just like you know maul them on the mat, they're not going to learn anything. But if you, Absolutely. the more stress, you know, the less learning. And if you keep it light and, and, and uh, fun, they will start to absorb things a lot better and more efficiently. And then, of course, as they're ready, you pressurize a little more and let them get a little bit out of their comfort zone, but not completely overwhelmingly out of their comfort zone because they don't learn like that. So Right. We, we do a lot of programs for uh, law enforcement and military, and especially with the law enforcement, one of the things we see is a lot of their training styles and systems emphasize the reality of what they're dealing with. They have an incredibly tough job. They've got to deal with, you know, some of the worst people in the world and they have, you know, the potential to, to lose their life or, you know, get severely injured at any one time. So there's a lot of stress in that. Whenever the cadets are being trained, one of the things they're told is, you know, if, if you lose, you die. So whenever they start to learn their defensive tactics programs, whether they're jujitsu or, or other systems, they are, you know, integrated. And a lot of times their first experience is to complete exhaustion so that, you know, they're forced under this stress so that they understand the gravity and the reality of the situation. Uh, you know, coming from special forces, one of the things that, that I learned is that's a very, you know, old school approach to certain types of training. And, and it does work in certain cases. But a lot of times what it does is it, it kind of mentally scars the individual to where they don't ever want to do that training again. So unless you force them to continually, you know, go back and, um, you know, retrain those skills, they're not going to do that training again. If it becomes an optional mm. thing, they'll opt out. So, you know, it's important to make the training something that everybody wants to opt into. You know, when I came to the University of Georgia, one of the fitness programs we instituted was a combatives, a military combatives training program that was jujitsu. Well, you couldn't just sign up for that portion of the training. We made it kind of exclusive to where you had to have a certain score on your, your basic fitness test before you could earn your way into doing those other two days of training in combatives. So we wanted to make it something that they wanted 
and make it a fun experience to where it was something they went after as opposed to something they were forced to do and regretted every second of. Oh, that's great. That's great. Building the positive neuro associations in the, in, into it. So wonderful. So tell us about Going Commando, Randy. What is that? And, and uh, <laughs> let well, us know about it. Going, going Commando is it's my personal coaching program that I work with folks on. And the whole idea of Going Commando came from this idea of when I got out and I, I tried to become a businessman. Uh, and I figured out that I, I wasn't a, a businessman at all, that I was, in fact, a soldier, that I was, uh, you know, with my background, I was a commando. And what I needed to learn was, you know, what were those lessons that made me successful in that previous career in the military? And how do I apply those lessons to business? And so, uh, you know, what I've done is I've taken that experience. And, and one of the best things about the military and even martial arts itself is that you get these kind of. Um, unstructured lessons that are a byproduct. And uh, my friend Alan Baker has a book that talks about it and really goes into to some of those. But these same lessons were concepts that I took in order to, uh, you know, help myself. And then I kind of defined them and outlined them. And one of the things I did was I, I tapped into the concept that, you know, everybody, you know, has a warrior inside them somewhere. Uh, some warriors are, are less, some are more, but they're all existing there and they're all ready to get out and, and, you know, conquer things. But you've got to figure out what type of warrior you are. So one of the first things I do is, is I get people to kind of search, you know, search to figure out what kind of warrior they are, whether it's, you know, a search and rescue mission or a search and destroy mission. So you've got to find your individual warrior and figure out what warrior type are you? Are you a Viking? Are you, you know, a Roman a uh, legionnaire? Are you a Spartan? Are you a samurai? You know, are you a, a Mongolian horseman? You've got to define your own warrior type. And so, you know, if you're if you're a Viking, then you know you're a seafaring North Germanic people that raided, traded, explored, and settled wide areas of Europe, Asia, and North Atlantic islands. Um, you know, in the late eighth, eighth to mid eleventh century. So the Vikings, you know, climbed on their warships, the the little longboats with the shallow draft hulls and went out, crossed the oceans, went up the rivers, and they went to conquer, but they didn't just go to conquer, they also went, you know, to trade. So if you're the kind of person that, you know, maybe you're a little rough around the edges, you, you know, they, they're known as hard drinking, hard fighting, bigger than life, and, and follow that philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. That's their core philosophy. So if you're a person that's all about discovering something new, exploring and chasing, you know, a little bit of wealth and riches and, and you're willing to go to great lengths in order to do it, then you may be a Viking. So the key is to kind of relate to that aspect. And, and the other idea is you may not always just be one type of warrior. You may change over time. You may adjust for certain circumstances. So once you've identified with that, there are certain lessons that you want to put into play in order to be successful. And, uh, you know, doing that, uh, su success itself is not just a skill, but it's a mindset. So once you adopt that mindset, then we start doing what you call, you know, what we call life in 3D. You know, you decide, you determine, and you do. You, you start by focusing on the basics because that's what every good warrior does. That's what I learned in special forces. That's what I try to emphasize in jujitsu is that above all, we want to be brilliant at the basics. And then, you know, there's some other key lessons that you probably remember from the military. You know, uh, one thing I would know I was always told was drink some water and do some PT, some fitness training. Right. right Ever right. told that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's usually the answer for when things aren't going your way. So if you drink some water, which is basic nutritional advice, you hydrate, you get some sleep, you do some good exercise, things start to look a little better. And then you can start to align things and put them back into place. You know, another key lesson that, that we learned in Special Forces, and it is taught mainly for shooting, but it applies to jujitsu very well, is called smooth is fast. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you, you want to do is you want to try to be smooth because haste makes waste. Um, you know, the idea of speed, surprise, and violence of action is one of the key concepts of the military, but it's important that you do it smooth. It, it can't be, you know, hasty, choppy speed. It's got to be smooth. And usually the best way to be fast is to be smooth. So we, we bring those things into play and kind of give you a framework 
on how to use those. And another concept we use is, is what the military calls metal. And I don't mean metal like, you know, like iron or steel that you hammer on. I mean metal as in, in mission essential task list. It's your, your list of things that you want to accomplish and how you're going to go about it. And, you know, it, it means, you know, for us and in the military, what I was taught is mission first, but people always. And so if you have those kind of core values built into your metal, your mission essential task list, as you go down through things that you're trying to accomplish and you have those core values in place, you're going to be more successful. And so, you know, we teach that along with some other key concepts. One that we use and transfer to jujitsu is what we call fighting the locked door. Uh, one of the the funniest things I think I ever saw at one time when we were doing some training, we were supposed to, you know, plan an explosive charge and enter a building. Uh, guys would come up and, and at this point we didn't have any explosives to blow the door. So guys had to kick it in. Well, the guy got ready to, to kick in the door. And before he did that, one of the other guys asked him to wait, took his hand, reached over and tried the doorknob. And it was open. So, you know, there's the one thing you don't want to do is constantly fight to and struggle to open a locked door. You're either going to blow it open and go or maybe you find another way in. So that's kind of a key concept that goes along with this going commando nice. thing. And so we do it. I do it as coaching for other business owners. I do it for individuals that, you know, just have personal things that they're trying to accomplish. And the idea is to give them a little different approach to how they can systematically you know, accomplish the things that they're looking to do to be successful. Yeah, some great concepts there. And I love any kind of education or, or training that gives kind of certain models or archetypes kind of thing where, you know, when you learn those, you can relate to different kind of people better. Like you mentioned the Viking. Just briefly tell us some of the traits of, say, the samurai and the uh, Spartan warriors. Okay, so so if you're if you're looking at you know the Spartans, you got to remember that they're a very uh, you know one-dimensional society. They're all about you know war and leadership in that regard. They don't believe in surrender. They don't believe in you know stepping back and and letting things you know revamp. They believe in in fight to the death. So if you've got a personality that that's your goal, you you may want to you know fight wholeheartedly, you know, complete and utter resistance to the fact that that whatever's coming against you and not surrender for a second. Now, the key there is you got to remember that the Spartans were also great strategic military leaders. So you don't want to just be stubborn and fight needlessly against something. You want to actually have a solid military plan with tactics in place, and you want to develop yourself through training so that, you know, you are a professional at whatever you do. That's what they were. They were professional soldiers. So they were very focused on that. You know, if you're a, a, a samurai, then you're a very systematic person that, that believes in service. You know, you're very faithful. You're, you're self-sacrificing to the point to where you will give everything of yourself to maybe your family or to, to your spouse or, or somebody else that you're a part of. You know, maybe you work for an organization and you give wholeheartedly you know, every part of your your work and your soul to that cause. They're very creative. They're very insightful, very intelligent. But above all, they're very systemized and everything has a purpose. Every movement, every ritual, everything that they incorporate into their process has a reason. And so if that's your, your you know, if you're kind of that perfectionistic person, that's the kind of personality that may uh, indicate that your warrior is a samurai. Love it. Love it. Like I said, I love he uh, hearing about things like that that can help you understand yourself as well as others and then relate in a, in a better way, a more positive, educated way with them. So that sounds exciting. I'll definitely put information <laughs> about that in the, the show notes for anybody that's interested in learning more about that, Randy. Awesome. Thank you. So when you think back on your, your life and your time growing up or your time in the military, your time through martial arts, I'm sure there's been a lot of key uh, people that have impacted your life. So who comes to mind? I know you already spoke about Professor Sauer. Uh, who else comes to mind as having one of the biggest impacts on your life, either on or off the mat, either one? Well, you know, undoubtedly, first and foremost, I got to say it was my mother. My mother was kind of that that aspect that I see in Professor Sauer, very loving, very caring, very supportive. 
So, you know, I always had that kind of backing from the beginning on whatever I decided I wanted to do. You know, there was always that encouragement there and that belief that, you know, I would do well at it. And so, you know, that's what allowed me to leave home from a small town in West Virginia, never having, you know, really traveled much before or been anywhere to go to the military and then, you know, have a career and a life that allowed me to visit, uh, you know, 55 different countries around the world, see the best and the worst of a lot of things in a lot of places. So I would say first and foremost, uh, there, you know, I also got some some really, you know, great encouragement on vision from Horian, because when I did spend that week with him, one of the things that that he imparted to me at the time, and, and it's very interesting to look back at it, you know, some 20 years later, and realize that, um, you know, at the time, he had this complete vision of where jujitsu is today, already thought out, already planned out. He saw it very clearly in his mind from, you know, the UFC, how big it could become and how jujitsu could be shared around the world. So that idea of being a visionary and, you know, really looking to how big things could become was imparted to me from him. But probably the biggest influences that I was lucky enough to to have impact me were the guys that I spent my time with in special forces, because one of the things that I saw there was just, um, you know, the idea and a lot of people today search for the the concept of not being afraid. Well, one of the things I learned there and, and I've heard Hickson talk about it is it's okay to be afraid. In fact, it's completely natural human and expected. Well, when I went into the military and even throughout my time in special forces, the entire time and today, I'm afraid of heights. Uh, So that kind of makes things real interesting when they want you to jump out of airplanes. (laughs) I bet it does. Repel down buildings or do any of that stuff. But the thing I learned from a lot of guys there, because I don't think very many guys tried to tell anybody that they weren't afraid. In fact, I remember, you know, some of the greatest heroes that that I was lucky enough to serve with and and to interact with would often say, well, yeah, you know, that scares the hell out of me. So they were obviously afraid and and they weren't afraid or even concerned to tell you that they were afraid. But the biggest impact was how they handled the fear and how they made sure that the fear didn't dictate what they were going to do about things. And so that was probably the most impressive and most impactful lesson that I think I've had in my life is don't let the fear dictate uh, your outcome or your direction on how you're going to approach things. And that's allowed me to to do things. Believe me, I was never more scared than when I decided to open up uh, an academy and try to be in business for myself, having never done anything like that, having had no business experience at all. But, you know, just having worked for the government and we all know that the government doesn't know how to make money. All they do is spend money. So I didn't think (laughs) I was going to be very successful. Well, really, man, it's really refreshing hearing about your special forces brothers. And, you know, people expect hardcore, you know, elite fighting forces. You know, I'm assuming a lot of people, they expect them to, to be like Superman or not have, you know, emotions or fear and all that. So it's great hearing that you guys were like real and you didn't try to pretend to be something you weren't. It's just like you said, what was important was how you dealt with it and how you handled it. But but you were vulnerable enough to say, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, this scares the hell out of me. So that's really refreshing. <laughs> and that's, well, the one thing real I did notice you know? is, is absolutely. And, and no one thing I did notice is that no matter how scared any of the guys were, it, it didn't change their the look on their face. It also <laughs> didn't change their actions that you knew had to be done. You know, it, right. it was predetermined what had to be accomplished. And regardless of what occurred or what happened, that was the mission. And it went forward, uh, you know, with whatever adjustments needed to be made. But the, the fear didn't change the situation. Mm-hmm. It was there. We, we definitely talked about it afterwards, sometimes in the moment if we had time. But the idea was that it wasn't going to alter what we were going to do to be successful. Nice, nice. And that's a huge point. You know, it's a it's a feeling. It's normal, natural and human. But uh, you still got to do the mission. <laughs> you got to you got to get through that and, and take care of business. Right. Right. And, and, you know, so often today we we hear folks talking about being triggered or being upset by something that was said or something that happened. And, you know, it's perfectly normal to be upset and and to have feelings about things that occur. But when you allow it to alter how you're going to live your life, Mm. then 
you know, it, it doesn't seem like it's a good thing at all. I and totally that was really what I learned there was that so many guys. And, and when I got there, I was a young kid. I was 19 years old. So I really didn't understand a lot of it. But because I was around it so long, just like being in jujitsu, I started to model the behavior that was surrounding me most of the time. And, you know, as a result, I got some really good habits that allowed me to be successful in a lot of different areas. And, and that's probably the, the greatest impact for me was to have that influence of those guys of just showing me, uh, you know, how to handle fear. Excellent. So as we're getting ready to close it up, Randy, a uh, couple of things. What's the biggest lesson that jiu-jitsu has taught you or that you've learned, you know, in jiu-jitsu? And what's the, the biggest joy that jiu-jitsu has brought you? I think, you know, the biggest lesson is that jiu-jitsu has taught me, uh, you know, to relax and try to figure it out. Uh, above all, you know, you always wind up in a situation where you're not comfortable, you're, you're not, uh, things aren't going your way, just like life. And you realize that if I stop and try to figure it out, you know, and, and when I say stop, I don't mean physically stop. I mean, it kind of mentally pause long enough to get your emotions under control and to analyze what you should be done based on what you know. You know, and so once you realize what should be done based on what you know, the next step is to do the best you can. The other part that that has influenced me with that is jujitsu teaches the greatest lesson in life to me. And that is that you don't necessarily come out on the downside if you lose. Okay? And a lot of people view it as losing, but but that's what jujitsu has taught me is that if you look at it as losing, then yes, it's negative. But if you look at it as learning, as so many people say, then you can find the lesson in it. And Professor does a really great job of, of understanding that. And I think the key now is to put yourself in a position where it's okay to lose. And you obviously there is a time and place to lose and, uh, and learn. And then there's a time and place to give it everything you've got because winning is critical. So as you, you know, set yourself up for success, you put yourself in training situations by going to the academy, by trusting in the group and, and, you know, the, the instructors that you have, and then you put yourself out there. And if you lose or you have to tap, that's okay. It, it's an opportunity for you to go back, analyze it and get better. And that's the same thing that occurred in special forces. When we did training missions, we would always do an after action review and look at what happened, what went well, what went wrong, you know, and if things didn't work out, we made sure that we gathered the lesson of why, and then we would go back and do it again and apply those lessons to be successful. So that has probably been the greatest lesson. The greatest joy by far for me has been the people. Uh, you know, it starts with the, the time and the, the interaction I have with my son whenever we train. As a father, it's given me some of the best opportunities to have some of the most difficult conversations there are that have to take place between a parent and a child. When I can get him, you know, lure him into the car and we've got a, a long drive to go to a seminar and he's trapped and now he has no choice but to talk to me about those things. We can always start off with something pleasant talking about jujitsu and then I can lead to a more serious subject and we can discuss it and then we can circle back and go train and then things are good. So I always have that opportunity, but also it's the people that it's brought into my life. Uh, you know, the the idea that I do get to train and, and hang out with Professor and get the benefit of all of his experience and have some of that personality hopefully rub off on me and, and become a better, nicer person. And then, you know, also all the other people that I've, I've had the opportunity to, to train with, that the people that come in and, you know, train with me and give me a portion of their life is really what they're doing. Because, you know, you can't create any more time. So when people come in and give me their time and share with me because they choose to, it's a it's a great honor and it gives me the opportunity to know people of all walks of life. So I get to, you know, understand all different types of careers, all kinds of different individuals, and I get to connect to them through jujitsu and, you know, learn things from a personal perspective that I would never have the exposure to otherwise. Wow. That's a lot, man. You, you've obviously benefited on a great level. Your life's been impacted, but you've also turned it around, gone full circle and, and paying it forward or, or giving it back, so to speak. So I know you've impacted a lot of lives. 
So certainly props and respect to you. I have one final question for you. Yes, sir. What makes Special Forces better than Navy SEALs? <laughs> you don't have to answer you know, that. I just wanted to say it. No, that's okay. I'll answer it. You know, the, the great thing about it is we do have this wonderful kind of competition. Uh, the one thing that I would say that, that makes us different and, and makes us special in another way is some of the greatest uh, things that, that are accomplished from Special Forces, you will absolutely never hear one word mumbled about. Uh, I like to give, and, and actually this past week, I just had lunch with one of my SEAL buddies and gave him a little bit of a hard time about this, is that, you know, there's a lot of disclosure of, of you know, great things that they've done that's being put out in movies and books. And the one thing you see a lot less of is guys in special forces, uh, you know, disclosing those things. We, we try to live by that uh, code of the quiet professional. But the other piece of it, I would say that we do a little bit differently and, and just out of necessity because there's a different mission is the in-depth and structured detailed planning because we have to plan for missions to where we're not going to necessarily have any additional assistance or involvement for months because we're going to go behind enemy lines. We're going to you know connect with a resistance element and we're going to train them, lead them and fight with them against you know, whoever the enemy is at the time. And a great example of that is what happened right after uh, 9-11 in Afghanistan, whenever members of my special forces uh, group went over, connected with different elements, and then immediately started to work with them and and uh, attack the Taliban in order to deal with that situation. So I would say, and based on my experience, having done a few operations and training with them, I think we just plan a little more detailed and a little more in depth, and that's what uh, you know separates us. Can't take a thing away from them. They are extremely physical. They're great individuals, you know, willing to give it all. And um, you know, some of the the greatest guys I know are seals. Uh, I hope they're not listening. I don't want them to get the big head about that. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're we're both on the same team overall. But there is definitely a friendly rivalry there. Sure. And. Uh, I, that's what I think is the difference. Uh, that's a great answer. I was I was actually asking it kind of like a joke, but um, I, I love the answer. <laughs> that's a really in-depth and informative answer. So wonderful. Well, man, thank you so much for your time and, and letting us get to know more about you and get to know you better. You're a class act. You've uh, touched a lot of lives and you're an inspiration. So uh, thank you so much. Much respect. And I really appreciate you uh, coming on. Thank you very much for having me, Marty. I, I always enjoy the conversations we have, uh, and I really appreciate uh, you ch sharing some of my background, some of my story, and letting me talk about uh, you know the gift of jujitsu that I've received. And hopefully, somewhere out there, somebody else will get inspired about it, and it'll have the opportunity to change their life the way it changed mine. I have no doubt, man. Long, healthy, and happy life, my friend. Strength and honor, brother. <laughs> right on. Take care, man. Take care. All right. Really enjoyed that conversation with Randy. Randy's the kind of person that the more you're around him, the more you want to be around him. Or the more you talk to him, the more you want to talk to him. Just has that kind of positive energy that really uh, makes you want to be uh, around him. So much respect to Randy and all the lives that he's impacting. All right. Up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. requires that you put yourself in the position to succeed. It means you see a finish line before one exists. Look, no one's ever going to call you and tell you how incredible your idea is. 
You can't build a business on potential or win a championship on promise. Results are binary. You either accomplished something or you simply did not. Right? That's it. That's what people see, the result. So that means every second, every step of the way from where you are right now until you cross the finish line depends on you and your thoughts. How you internalize failure, how you look at setbacks, when no one is around to pat you on the back or tell you how great you are, will you have enough self-belief to move forward? Because my friends, that's the hardest part. That's what no one talks about. Having the courage to wake up every single day of your life and know that you are building towards something incredible. You are creating a masterpiece from the ground up. And that means that when you're looking in the mirror, you believe in what's staring back at you. You see the unseen and you are willing to bring it to life. That is the foundation that you build greatness on. And it's a daily pursuit, creating milestones, designing the small wins that keep you going, that keep you moving, that get you past all those times you so desperately want to turn around, but know that for you, it simply isn't an option. That is not your reality. You have more waiting for you. And so you press on, cloaked in confidence, you move into the unknown, seeking the day the rest of the world looks up and calls you lucky. They'll look at what you built and say how fortunate you are, but they won't comprehend the 20 hour days, the focus, the ridicule for being different or obsessive or nonconformist. They won't know that self-belief trumped all of that that it was everything. The word great is separate for a reason. It implies a specific set of beliefs and values. It means you saw light when most people saw darkness. It means you said yes when most people said no. You move forward when the rest of the world turned around. Believe in your greatness. See it, live it. It is there and you need to know that it's there because it will make all the difference. Your self-belief will define you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and the link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat. <laughs>